Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new interview from MinMax. My name is Ben Hansen, and MinMax is a Patreon about games, friends, and getting better, so thank you for being here. Today's interview is with Dan Callen, who's had a fascinating career, a fascinating run through the video game industry. He has worked on WarioWare Twisted, The Matrix Online, Halo 3, Resistance 2, Ratchet & Clank, Halo Reach, Halo 4, Destiny, Destiny the Taken King, Forspoken, uh, and now he is the new lead level designer for Postcard Games studio. But in this interview, we talk about what it actually takes to develop these great games. He is a great person for just sharing his perspective on working in the tools on these amazing projects, his transition over to Japan to work on Forspoken with Luminous Productions, what it's like to go from Destiny to Forspoken as your projects, what it's like to design an open world, especially being a big fan of Breath of the Wild. It's an interesting conversation. We hope you enjoy it. If you do enjoy it, we'd always appreciate it if you subscribe to MinMax's YouTube channel. Check out our other interviews. And if you really want to help support independent games media like this, you can head on over to patreon.com slash minmax with two N's and support us at the $5 tier, where you will unlock the podcast version of this interview, all of our other interviews, early access to the MinMax Show podcast, Patreon exclusive podcast. There's a ton in there. So we appreciate the support. And without further ado, here's Dan Callen. Dan Callen, welcome to MinMax, man. Yeah, nice to be here. Yeah, thanks for being here. You have a really interesting path through the game industry. You're one of those people that pops up every once in a while on Twitter, at least for me, and I look through it, and it's like, these studios that you have worked at, you have, like, seen so many slices of this industry. Sorted, sorted past. Yeah, yeah man. So yeah, congratulations. It, it, to me, it's, to me it's, it's odd to think about, but yeah, when you lay it out on a line, it's, it's, yeah, it's interesting to go back and, and go over those, those roles I've had. It's, yeah, like you said, it's very, <laughs> it's very spotted career history. <laughs> Spotted is a very funny way Spotted. to put it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, where, how did you get your start in the game industry? Um, so I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so it was a good coincidence. We had a lot of gaming companies around here from from way back in the day. Um, Nintendo's always been here. Um, Microsoft, even before Xbox was here. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of history in in the game industry around here. And I had a relative who lived pretty close to Nintendo's home base when I was in elementary school. And so whenever we drive by, I'd see the big Nintendo logo on the oh outside of that God. building. It's like, oh, what's going on in there? I got to know what's going on there. Because, you know, when, when you're a kid, you have that first realization of, oh, people make things. Like this thing that I have. Yeah, a human being sat down and, and worked on it and made it. So that was when I was in elementary school. So it's, it's, since then, it was always like, okay, these places exist. I can get in there somehow. Do you think genuinely um, just seeing the Nintendo sign is what pushed you over the edge to want to become a game developer? Uh, I think the wheels were in motion before that. It was I would always doodle things like Mario levels in my notebooks and, and all the things that kids do. But but it was putting that together with oh here's a real place where grownups go into and work and they get money to do this. It was yeah. it's all it's all kind of abstract until you realize that that oh this is a real thing you can do. So yeah. And then if you're in the Pacific Northwest, like. That's basically the equivalent of working at a subway. It's just everybody. Of course, <laughs> you're going to get hired on at Bungie. It's no oh, big yeah. deal. Oh, no. board. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, the, the first job was right out of high school. Um, there was a an outsourcing company that worked with Microsoft, and their job was to do lot checks on Xbox hardware. So whenever Microsoft would say, "Oh, this is a cheaper DVD drive we can put in here. Here's cheaper parts we can we can configure and, and put together. Let's put this through the ringer in a test environment." for a while before we sell it to people and it explodes in their homes. Um, this wasn't 360, so don't blame me for that. Um, <laughs> uh, original Xbox. So they would call you at maybe 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, and they'd say, we need 40 people today to come in and, and pound away these Xboxes, um, be there or be square. So I lived about an hour away. I lived out in the country. So I would get up 7 a.m., drive the 45 minutes to an hour to the, this warehouse, You'd stand outside in the morning, wait for a guy to come open the door, and you'd start counting people off, start counting heads. Like, okay, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, we have our people. The rest of you go home. <laughs> oh, so you do that. Um, go into this building, and you sit down in front of um, a single television and four Xboxes that were all inside of a cage. So there's four Xboxes in a cage with little holes in the cage, and you get a wooden stick, and you'd poke the wooden stick to eject... All the, you know, all the discs from all the Xboxes, swap the discs, close the drawers, get a stopwatch, time it for 20 minutes, and then watch the TV as it, like, cycled through the inputs. Just make sure nothing went wrong. And you do this for eight hours a day. 
and that sounds boring but then you get to go home and break your friends like i'm working on the xbox oh, everybody oh, i played i played fusion frenzy for 20 minute <laughs> intervals oh that's sweet um, living yeah but there was no pc in front of you you had a xerox sheet of paper and a pen and if a bug happened you'd write down the bug and you'd hand it to your test lead and then yeah you'd go back to it so weird yeah and then the first big place was bungie so well, the first Big place was Bungie. After that, it was Nintendo. Oh, really? So, yeah, I was I was a tester at Nintendo on the Game Boy Advance um, WarioWare Twisted. Oh my God, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a good pull. Um, so that was a fun thing to test. It's my first real game that I worked on because number one, it had the gyroscope attachment to it. Yeah. Yeah, which made which made for a lot of a lot of interesting bugs, um, but. To capture those bugs, you had to disassemble the hardware and attach the gyroscope to a GameCube controller and go to a special Game Boy player and have like spool of, of ribbon going from this this Frankenstein controller to the, the console um, to record it on VHS tape. So you'd have these VHS tapes that you'd put in the VHS recorder and then you'd sit on a stool and spin around for 50 rotations to reproduce this one bug and then go back to your desk and yeah so that was that was an interesting project to work on okay so testing a warrior work game seems bizarre because the game is so quirky i feel like if there's some visual glitch or something like you wouldn't even be able to detect it most of the time because the game is so yeah. chaotic it's like well i guess maybe that was a joke that everything flashes green in this micro yeah. game whatever and the other level to it was like the game had already been properly tested in japan okay so this is just the hardware they, stuff they, well, they send it to America for what they call localization testing. Mm. So it's to see like, oh, is this joke translated okay? Are there spelling errors? Do the menus look okay after we translate it to English? Do you also think so, poop and farts are funny? Just kind of the basic yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Will this joke fly in America? Do you get this joke? <laughs> and WarioWare has a very unique sense of humor. So That's that was also another fun part of it. Um, yeah, just seeing what would, what would pass for a Western audience. And then after Nintendo, I went to um, Microsoft. No, no, no. I went to Monolith. Um, so this was around the fear condemned days, right? But I was a game master for the matrix online. Hell yes. Yeah. So that was, that was, I like to say it wasn't a fun job, but there were like very small increments of time where it was one of the most interesting jobs I've ever had. Why is that? So, so the matrix online was set up. I don't know if, if any other MMO has tried to do this since that time, but, um, one of the big selling points for Matrix Online was there are characters from the Matrix played by real human beings running around this game and interacting with players. And so they had a whole separate internal team they called the Live Events team. And those guys were responsible for, oh, this guy's playing Morpheus today. He's going to go talk to this clan. What? Yeah. <laughs> so so for, for maybe once or twice during that job, I got to be, I got to be Morpheus <laughs> and go talk to people as Morpheus in the Matrix. Wow. Um, yeah, okay, so you're which actually... is why when I saw... You're like responding mm -hmm. to people, like direct. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. could actually talk to Morpheus. Yep, yep. They so they'd have they'd have. I think if you think of it in terms of modern games, they have seasons in the game, right? And this storyline would go on on all the different servers, and and depending on which faction won the serve the the server game that month, they would get an audience with a character and get to direct the narrative for that server. And it was a really unique idea. Yeah, it's a, it a shame the game didn't didn't last much longer, <laughs> but um. But yeah, it's, it it was it was interesting getting to play play Morpheus in this weird MMO, and I also got to play like an agent who could just go run around one shotting people. <laughs> oh my fun. god, that's awesome! Yeah, was it? Did you get yeah. like guidance on what Morpheus talks like? Or are you just kind of doing your yeah. best approximation? Just like, hey, don't make <laughs> jokes. Just play everything straight and be cool, and you'll be set. It was kind of a spreadsheet of like, oh, if some player asks about this, kind of guide them like this, and then, so so you try to keep like the the Morpheus tone like. Like, oh, yes, children of Zion, I am helping you with X, Y, Z. It was wild, but um, but you got some guidance from people who were much better at it than, than you were for, for the times where they needed you. But yeah. uh, other than that, they had that, their own team in, in, in the studio doing that kind of work, and it was fascinating. And now this made headlines uh, when Resurrections was coming out, the idea that Morpheus isn't going to be in Resurrections because he canonically died in the Matrix Online. Oh, yeah. Now, were you yeah. playing as Morpheus as he died in the MMO? I was not. No, oh. there was a cutscene that explains that that event. Um, I won't try to go into the details of the story because it's it's a pretty wild 
scene <laughs> when you think when you when you get the details of how Morpheus is killed in in the Matrix Online. Yeah, I don't think I could do it justice, but it's it's pretty crazy if you know the history of the Matrix in video games as well. Like they did stuff in the games that was pretty nuts in uh, terms like, of canon. Well, there was that what that that one ending where it's we are the champions playing for for one of those games. I forget which one. Of yeah, those. yeah. Enter the Enter the Matrix, or oh no, it was like the Path of Neo. I think so. Yeah, where the the directors just come up and start talking about the game. And <laughs> it's like, so good. Yeah. Well, look, Chrono the, Trigger did that. All classic games. Pokemon yeah, does it yeah, all yeah. the time. You got to break that fourth wall. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> what uh, do you, uh, did you have to like really be up on your Matrix lore? to do that or was it just like i can talk as morpheus no one's going to ask me some bit about the history of zion or yeah anything. yeah yeah. if they got to in the weeds you could kind of divert them by like oh let's that's not important right now we have to talk about what's happening in the world at this time it was pretty much like yeah get get what you need to tell the story and, and push them in the in the yeah. direction of the storytelling that they were doing but um but yeah it was it was wild having like an audience of people like seriously role playing as they were matrix characters. Oh, they, we have an audience with this character. That's so Another really good. interesting thing was as a GM, your player model was, was like an a actual agent of the matrix. And when we had to discipline people, we had, you know, the white room, like the white like the space architects. that all the guns. Oh, come oh from. yeah. 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 Um, so it was a mix of that and the interrogation desk from the scene with Neo when he first meets the agent. Right. And so if someone breaks the rules, we teleport to this room in the skybox that's like a blank white walls with a desk in front of it. And we're telling people, hey, sit in this chair. You're banned for a week for saying naughty words in the game. But the I'm an agent. I have this power. The downside is that's kind of cool. Like you would want to see yeah. it in space. So there was a glitch in the game. Where if you were riding, we had like like subways and trains in the game. And if you were sitting down on a subway car and you did the action to roll forward, if you'd like double tap forward, you'd roll. So the train would keep moving, but you'd stay in the air. So people would roll and roll and roll, and they were able to roll up into the skybox. And someone discovered like, oh, if I roll in this specific position, I can get into this white room with the desk. Oh, weird. <laughs> um, yeah, so you'd have players getting their whole clans in that room and taking screenshots. And, but just by <laughs> chance, one day I come into the room and I see a group of people in here and they're like, I can look into their chats. So it's like, okay, okay, hurry. We got to do this quick. Everybody get in your positions, blah, blah, blah. And I just start like freezing and muting people, freezing, muting, freezing, muting. And then I like reveal myself. I'm like, hey, what's uh, what's going on? What, uh, what are you doing in this special room? Um, it's so weird. Now, just kind of like. The coolest thing possible would be like, you know, if, if someone's just being a real piece of work in the game, if you could bring them into that world and then actually like their character's mouth would like, ooh, ooh, and actually like seal up and they couldn't talk anymore. Like there's so what many opportunities for the Matrix. If you cannot speak. <laughs> exactly. Um, at the end of, of the, the first open beta, we had a world ending event where we, we changed, everything was all ominous and spooky and we changed the skybox to have like eyeballs in it. But yeah, the thing that closed out that beta was all the player characters getting mashed into little balls and then dropping on the ground and <laughs> getting awesome. logged out. So yeah, we used the Matrix stuff a couple times to, to pretty fun effect. What uh, What's going on? I know we just got the, the tech demo for Matrix Awakens, is that what it was called? But it is yeah. bizarre that there hasn't been a big Matrix game. Considering Since, the narrative of the latest movie, right? I know yeah. it's yeah. mind-boggling. Yeah, I, I was. Yeah, I was kind of shocked it took that that turn. I, I don't know if it's okay to. Spoil. Yeah, we don't need to. We don't need to. If you've yeah. seen it, you've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's fine. But if if you're interested in the the glamorous world of game development, go watch the new Matrix movie and that's see right. how that works out. That's yeah. right. Okay, so Jesus, I didn't even know Monolith was on the docket. Okay, so Monolith, yeah. then to Bungie. Monolith then to Microsoft Game Studio. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So so you gotta realize like if you're a tester, um, you don't you if you're a contract tester especially, you don't stay at places very long. Like right, right. the Nintendo thing was three months for the project. Um, Monolith could have been longer, but they sold the game to Sony and then laid everything off. Um, Fun. And then yeah, and then Microsoft. This next Microsoft gig was the first one that I'd be there for like a full a full year. So this was like a full year of testing and we worked on, um, we're working on an RTS called rise of nations, yeah. rise of legends. Hell yeah. So it was like an offshoot of the rise of nations franchise with mythical creatures. And so that was a pretty fun job. Was it, um, uh, Brian Reynolds? Was he working on that one too? Is that his name? Uh, big, it was big, huge games. Yeah. Um, I forget who the, yeah, who the, the lead was on that one, yeah, but, that's, that's um, 
but yeah, it was it was a it was a pretty fun project. That was the first project that I like owned an area of the game. So I tested the AI in like uh, skirmish mode for hours and days and days of my life. And yeah, yeah. So, so that that was like, another step up. And then we get to Bungie. Finally. Okay. And this is <laughs> yeah. like Halo Three era of Bungie. Halo Three, yes. Okay. Um, when what were you working on there? So um, at Bungie, I was a what was called a build verification tester. So um, when you have a big game studio, um, you have programmers writing code, you have people adding content all the time. And at the end of the day, that gets all wrapped up into the build of the day. So you have your version of the game that you're distributing to the team to use for the day. So um, before anyone got their hands on it, the build verification testers would get that build, get the tools for the game, do a series of tests to make sure, hey, if everyone opens this editor, it's not going to you know, glitch out horribly and waste everyone's work for the day. So as soon as that passed those tests, you put it into the main branch of, of the developer um, file share. They all get it. They're able to safely work for the day. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was that was my job. Where do you Halo think, um, from your vantage point at least, uh, where does the development of Halo Three rank for just overall stressful projects that you've been working on? Halo Three, honestly, there have been worse projects. Okay. <laughs> like, um, at least, at least from my perspective, um, it was definitely a lot of work in, in terms of of what I was assigned to do. I got to do a lot of of a variety of things because in, in those days. I think Bungie wasn't even over 200 people yet. So if they needed something done that was just kind of a a random task for the day, they were like, okay, you know enough about the content of the game and how it's made. We're going to let you do, we're going to let you do something in the game today, which was just really code word for we're too busy, do this menial task. So for example, um, one of my jobs was looking through enemy animations and finding the keyframes where their feet hit the ground and assigning an event that says, oh, you make noise here. <laughs> so, so going through every yeah, every walking animation, every running animation, just saying, okay, here's where noise happens. Here's where you make footprint in snow. And just that minuscule amount of content they trusted me with. I love that, um, but that's so something good. nice and specific. Then you can play the game and be like, that was me, that was me. Yeah, absolutely. Every footstep, you can um, shout it. Yeah, and then later later on in development too, they, they put me on the team that did all the cutscenes and cinematics. Um, so... I did some I did some help with like attaching guns to hands and um, making sure that the the cinematic scripting like on the game side worked and um, so that was yeah that was in terms of what I learned I don't think I've I've ever gone into a job with less of like blank brain knows nothing and left a job with more like oh I know how this game works on on multiple levels now it was just so such a insane learning experience yeah and then the launch of that game was like the biggest thing ever. Oh, it was it was crazy. Yeah, just seeing and that was the first one where my name had been in the credits of a game before, but it was the first time I was like, yeah, it's in there now. <laughs> right, know, like, yeah. like it's not it's not the Matrix anymore. It's, um, but yeah, it was it was overwhelming to to be a part of that team and at that time. And you knew while you were working on it, it was something special. Like my clearest memory of the first day I came in there was walking through the, the that group of of artists and seeing that Halo 3 Warthog in like a special level they used to test lighting and they were like shooting bits of it off and it's just like oh this is so real to me now <laughs> oh that's amazing <laughs> yeah and um, then and then from there to Insomniac from there well I took a brief uh, layover uh, at a company called Flying Lab in Seattle which uh, worked on an MMO called Pirates of the Burning Sea okay. Uh, it was a yeah pirate themed MMO, huh. um, and so I was doing QA there, and then yeah I got the call to go to Insomniac down in California. Are you being headhunted like throughout your career? Uh, how what's the ratio of you reaching out to folks versus folks reaching out to you? Beginning, um, it was a lot of me just seeing what was out there and applying for literally everything that I could. Yeah. Um, so. If it was near me if it was if they were looking for QA it was like okay yeah I want to be I want to be on this um for I think the the second half of my QA career um I yeah I didn't really interview for places anymore cuz there was such a network of people that oh this guy knows this guy so it, you know especially if you're a tester and you stick around long enough you start seeing the same faces pop up yeah. in your jobs like okay this contract's done where are you going next oh I don't know right, yet right. um but uh, but yeah, it it got to that point eventually. But once yeah, once you ship a, a good few 
titles, those calls start coming in. But yeah, when you're when you're doing week to week, you know, turning Xboxes on and off, not a lot of not a lot of demand. No one uses um, a wooden stick like Dan. You got oh, yeah. to this. I got I got that dowel, that dowel <laughs> technique. I got uh, the twenty minutes in my brain. So you went from well, uh, there's pirates in the middle, but you went from Halo to then Resistance, or are you working on Ratchet and Insomniac, or yeah, um, Resistance Two was the first thing okay. I was on Insomniac. Yeah, wow. so I was doing the same the same kind of job I was doing at Bungie, which was um, looking over the the tools and processes that Insomniac used and and testing those um, and and making sure those tools were functional for the team. Um, but yeah, during that period of time, that was Resistance. There was a Ratchet and Clank um, DLC only game, a digital only game, Quest Quest for Booty. Okay, right. Uh, and then started Resistance Three, and what would eventually become uh, Fuse. It was called it was called something else at the time. Overstrike. But it shipped. To, yeah, Overstrike. Yeah. Yep. 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 Um, yep. And then after Insomniac, uh, hang on, hang on. Well, 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 okay, okay. Look, well, look, there's a lot to unpack in all these things. We, this could be okay. a five hour interview. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Shifting from Halo ultimately to resistance. Um, I mean, naturally it's like, Oh man, were you spilling all of Xbox and Bungie secrets? But I imagine that you're the bell of the ball to some extent, because everybody must be wanting to ask you like, yeah, hey, working on resistance. Uh, what's the, what's Halo look like under the hood, Dan? You got, you got any tips yeah. here? Did you feel like you're really valuable just for being able to share like, what the cream of the crop looks like? Um, it's, it's, it's really interesting because you, once you start going around to different, different studios, you start getting, you get, getting the feeling that everyone's in it together. Like, yeah, like no one's, no one's really wishing failure on anyone else. It's a big industry. Everybody wants everybody to succeed. So when you, the first day you're in, in, in a new space, you're like, Oh, I worked on this, this, and this, there's a lot of people like, Oh, I love this. That's like the best, the best, one of the best parts of working in the industry is, is getting to know, who worked on what and like getting to gush about totally. your favorite things to people. So there's a bit of, of, of like, Oh, how did, how did they do this? And you can't say too much because you know, stuff's under NDA and whatnot. Huh. Um, but, uh, but yeah, just, just that general knowledge sharing is something that informally happens all the time. Yeah. Um, if there was like a best practice way to do stuff like, Oh, this is how I wrote this test case. This is how I, I organized my, you know, my, my uh, morning, tests to see if this software worked that's you know that's not like that's fine but then you get into like oh tell us how this piece of code worked in halo like how did the aim you know aim resistance and auto aim work and it's like oh, i didn't yeah. really know that stuff but i couldn't really tell you if i wanted to what's but, the um, secret of the footsteps dan you must tell <laughs> yes. us please tell me which keyframe the brute <laughs> chieftain uh, yeah so, so no, nothing nothing super in in depth like that but you do have conversations yeah. like oh how would this team approach this problem or how would you know right um, right uh, I, I'm fascinated by the shift from Overstrike to Fuse because Fuse was a Game Informer cover story. And so uh, we visited the studio back then. And I remember seeing art of like the main character, like I think it was the main character, like riding a buffalo. And I remember talking to TJ Fixman and he was like so on board and excited for like that original direction of Overstrike. And then it came yeah. out and Fuse is like, it's solid. I actually just bought a copy a couple weeks ago. I'm, I'm looking forward to finally playing through it. But like it came out, and it was solid. But were you kind of bummed about that shift? Was it really exciting at the beginning for just how weird it was? The beginning, it was at a time too where Insomniac was 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 expand like going into a lot of different directions with a lot of interesting pitches. And well, because also I saw, it was also like you know they were making what Outer Knots. They were really trying on every different platform in that era, right? Yeah, yeah. There was a push to to kind of change their their development model and change like a, a lot of things internally as well but um but yeah seeing the initial concepts for overstrike i, I was i was gone before it became anything corporeal but right. seeing the initial concepts for that and a couple other things they were working on it was super exciting yeah it was kind of stuff that everybody got excited for because you get into a, a pattern of of resistance ratchet resistance ratchet totally. like there was it was a very like say like like very very um tight schedule as well at that time because insomniac was was like hey we're making a game we're shipping a game a year this is what we're doing and so you could see kind of the the fatigue that that some people carried with them when it was just like oh we're moving to this between this and this and this but then when something new shows up you get a lot of excitement behind it you get a lot of 
and th- and that's happened in other places I've worked as well. Like, yeah. like you get into kind of in AAA, you get you're you're prone to get into ruts where you're like, oh, here's time for another Halo game. <laughs> Let's, um, but yeah, it was it was interesting seeing, knowing what that initial concept was, and then seeing what it became was was very interesting to me. Yeah, what um what stands out about Insomniac in retrospect compared to every other place you worked? Insomniac was a very good place to work. Really? I'll give them a lot of praise for, um, at least during my time there, it was their 15th anniversary. And um, to celebrate the anniversary, they invited everyone in the company on a cruise um, to the Bahamas. That's so as a tester, yeah, as a tester, you used to be in like, oh, you get treated kind of like a lower class citizen. And yeah, you're not really, you don't really feel like part of the team. But inside Insomniac was like, no, everybody's going. That's so awesome. pack, pack your stuff and, and come out with us. So yeah, it was, it was for me at that time, a really, a really nice place to work. Yeah. And I think they do like alphabetized credits. And I wonder how much of that is still kind of that same philosophy. Yeah, like, oh, I same wonder. Board. Yeah, just kind of equal, equal contribution. Um, that was that was really cool to see too, because um, before, if you were a contractor, if you were a contract tester on a game, I did. I don't even have a credit in the Nintendo game. I wish it was just like yeah, a couple of weeks and you're gone. You don't need to be in the credits. Right. But you also you always have to have um, a modifier on your name that shows. Oh, they didn't really work for Microsoft. They worked for parentheses contract company. Right. Like, so, oh. so you can always tell, oh, here's where the contractors are coming up. You can see all their names in, in the parentheses at the end. Um, so yeah, it was also my first actual full-time job that I was hired by the studio and not the the um, the contracting agency that they were outsourcing to. So gotcha. that was gotcha. a big milestone for me there. Yeah. And then Insomniac transitioned to... Back to Bungie. <laughs> back to Bungie, of course. Yeah, so back to Bungie. Um, I was on Halo Reach uh, as doing the same thing I was doing on Halo 3. Um, Hang on, so you've, so you've been hired by Bungie three separate times? Yes. <laughs> that is um, wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but this time it was more of like, oh, we know we know you. You were on the team before. Not a lot of, you know, we're not going to stand on, on, you know, ritual. You just kind of come on in. We know you can do this job. Um so yeah, Halo Reach was was another fun time. Yeah, but that's um, I mean that has to be a, what you were talking about earlier. Like that entire studio must have just been like, oh my god, one more <laughs> Halo. We're giving you one more, and then we have to move on to this Destiny crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a um, funny story about about the editor that was used to make all of the bunchy Halo games, and um, the level editor. Uh, going all the way back to the original Halo, there was no undo functionality in the level editor. What? So if you made a mistake in that level editor, you were fixing it manually. So it became a, re- a recurring joke that, oh, on Halo 3, I'm going to log this bug that there's no undo feature and make a feature request, and someone's going to be like, yeah, it'll be in the next Halo. And then the bug gets passed along through the history of, of the Halo franchise. It's like, oh, put undo in the level editor. Oh, we'll do it next time. We'll do it next time. And then a story I heard... Um, when the Destiny tool set came out, was there was an internal meeting, and the first thing they announced was, we have Undo, and the engineer got a standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you, this is a very dumb question, what do you do without an Undo? How does that even work? You just load up a previous, up. <laughs> just load up a previous yeah. version of the build, or like, how does that? Um, it was, it was so what, what was done in this editor was kind of like the positioning of, of, assets inside of a level okay. so not usually not a lot of stuff that required like like big you know sweeping changes but like there was one bug where if you have a a, a volume um that you're selecting a vert a vertex of and your face that the vertex is facing the camera and you click on it and drag it it would pull it infinitely towards the, the camera you were looking at in the viewport okay and so if that ever happened you're like well gotta start over okay. again with this volume but um yeah, it was, it was an interesting time because cause that, that's another thing you get to see from the inside is just how jerry-rigged and duct taped and stapled together video games are just no matter where you go. Yeah, I, uh, I cannot even imagine. I, I, I mean, are the tools, I mean, I know they're night and day compared to how they were in the past, but does it still feel impossibly duct taped together, like even the modern games that you're working on? Um, in terms of just... just the amount of, of assets and what you need to get them to work together. It, it, it just feels like seeing a game running to me is, is magic no matter what. So I won't, I won't go into specifics about like, like tools and, and whatnot, because 
it's it's absolutely something that's getting better, like exponentially yeah. better tools and workflows across the industry as we realize, hey, we can't keep throwing more people at problems. We need to make the problems easier to solve. Um, but you never lose that that feeling of, oh, wow, this was just an animation that was running on a loop on someone's desk, you know, a couple of days ago, and now it's in this game through, no matter how many different exporters and, and editors they had to use to get that animation in, into game data. It's always fascinating to me, just the, the pipe, the pipes that these pieces of content have to go to, to become games. Um, yeah. So yeah, you never lose that. Yeah. Okay. So then from Halo Reach, ship that. It was great. Yes. Um, and this go, is going to the 343 era. Of That's Halo. fascinating. Okay. So yeah. what is that like? They're starting with 343 and there's mm-hmm. whispers around Bungie about, Who's gonna head over there? Um, no, I was I was I was at end of my contract at Bungie, so I was a contractor again, going back to Bungie. So okay. you do your your year, and then okay, see you later. <laughs> um, so I was looking for another job, and I get a message from uh, one of the the test leads over at three four three, who's like, "Hey, we heard of you from Bungie. We have this um, this project." They wouldn't say what it was. <laughs> we have a project that your skills may be useful in in uh, helping us out with. Because they wouldn't even say 343. It was unnamed at that point? It was 343, but they <laughs> wouldn't say Halo 4. They, they wouldn't say it to anybody. They, if they were very, very adamant that, like, if you go outside of these walls and you say Halo 4, it's, you're done. <laughs> like, Jesus. Don't, don't, yeah, keep it, keep it quiet. Okay, so this is, because I know that originally, wasn't 343 just going to contract out and wasn't Gearbox going to make Halo 4? Not super I'm... familiar with, with that. Um, I think uh, all I know was, was was from when I was there, it was all the plan was okay. internal. So that's when they um, were building up internally and we're bringing you on to a project and the name of our studio is 343, but don't ask any questions beyond that. Yeah, yeah it's like, oh, you're a, you are a specific kind of tester. Um, you know, you have a skill set that would be very helpful, but we won't tell you what you're going to be working on. And then as soon as I walk in the door, they're like, yeah, it's Halo 4. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so in the very early days of, of 343, uh, development. I was I was doing the same job I was doing at Bungie because 343 had gotten a a tool dump from Bungie. Like they were contractually obligated to say like, okay, here's the tools you can you can have them. And as you can imagine, over you know the years and years, Halo was under production. There's there's some aspects of that editor that are completely either obfuscated or there's things that are just you know deprecated technology that nobody knows what it does anymore. Right. Right. Um. So I was able to get in there and be like, okay, no, this is this is how you get AI to move from point A to point B. Here's how you set up an enemy encounter and things like that, um, which, which is what I would do in my spare time. This, this is a nice segue into <laughs> the next stage of the career. Um, so working on Halo 3 and Reach, I would love in my spare time to just set up enemy encounters because the, the way you set up uh, Halo enemy encounters is just, it's it's like... It's like I think the closest analogy is is it's like making a football play. Like you have all your players on the field and you're you're setting up their AI behaviors via these special call and response uh, sets of data, and, and you just like oh I'm placing these props and I'm putting vehicles in here, and it became like a toy box for me. That when sounds I, great. You know, when, whenever I had a spare minute, it's like oh let's see how you know three ghosts fight an AI controlled tank. Um, okay, now let's see how you know these pelicans fly around in a circle. But yeah, it, it was just any kooky idea I could figure out how to do with with those tools. I would just like let it let it rip. Yeah. Um, so when I got there, um, I was doing this this testing job for a couple months, and um, an internal opening for a uh, mission designer opened up in the studio. And so as as uh, a part of that application process, um, you have to take a design test. And they're like, okay, in whatever editor you choose, take the encounter that you, you know, wrote a design document about and put it in an engine and make it run. Interesting. So I was like, I was like, okay, well, I'll just do mine in the Halo engine. <laughs> um, so I did mine in the actual Halo tool set, and the the design leads looked at it. And like, well, there's stuff that you did here that we don't really know how to do. So if you could just tell us how to, how you scripted that marine to perform that custom animation so i was in a position and i was like well maybe give me a job and i'll tell you <laughs> how about you uh, pay up buddy yeah that's hmm. interesting don't do it for free uh, but no um yeah so that's how i transitioned into 
the, the design side of things. How, so how much of an overhaul was there for the tech from Halo Reach to Halo 4? Um, so we added, 343 added Undo. So that was, that was another thing that they did. Really? Um, in terms of the tech, I, can't, I don't know a lot of specifics. Um, but I do know there was, there was a lot of changes made because seeing that, that game run on an Xbox 360 at the time, it was kind of shocking to see yeah. what, what what they pulled off with some of those some of those um, graphical improvements. Um, just yeah. yeah, just getting it to run was 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 an ordeal. But um, but yeah, they they pulled it off. I think. Yeah, we uh, we just interviewed uh, Ryan Payton talking about his career. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and he talked about that that period of time as being extremely stressful and traumatic uh, for him, and he's a lot of regrets. Uh, what was your perspective just on like the the tone of the studio as that entire project was built? Yeah. Up? Um, there was a lot of what I could describe as Ryan's feelings at the beginning. Um, I came onto the design side a little later. I think Ryan, um, Ryan was involved for a brief time, uh, in my stay at 343, but yeah, it's just the pressure of, of this franchise. Like, what can you do to, to improve upon it? Like, how do you take the reins from these people who just defined, console fps games um so yeah the, the pressure was always there um but yeah it, 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 but along the way we you kind of develop those those bonds as a team that are like okay no one expects a lot out of us let's you know let's show them what we can do and the team was, was very strong like I, I they're they're still like the core group of people i worked with i still keep in touch with to this day be like, hey, remember, you know, this kerfuffle over this thing. Like, just, just some of the stuff we were trying to do as well was 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 kind of nuts to think about today. Like the the, the mammoth <laughs> Halo Four was just a giant, like the biggest moving vehicle that had to follow like a set path that was AI controlled. Just thinking about it now, it's like, oh, that, what, why'd we try to do that? <laughs> um, then, but yeah, it, it yeah. And then there was like those the episodic co-op story beats i forget oh, the name oh, of Spart- the spartan ops the spartan ops yeah i was just like that's such yeah. a cool idea we'll see if you can pull it off and the answer was they kind of did it it wasn't revolutionizing the industry but it was a cool idea to like constantly update yeah. with new story content yeah and and thinking about it like back in the day not a lot of games were, were even attempting those kind of like seasonal based narratives right especially right. for pve content like um so it i think yeah it was it was a super um interesting attempt to to see something that we were seeing with like games as a service today like it it evolved from that point so yeah what um what did you learn i guess through your entire career but just about like leadership and the importance of strong leadership the do's and don'ts of being a team leader for, for game development it's being able to sell your vision it's being able to say like this is my clearly defined um vision for this this game not only as as for moment to moment gameplay, like you got to sell the world, you have to sell, you know, the mechanics, you have to sell the characters, you have to sell, you have to just have to be a world class salesman to get a team to buy into a concept. Um, and yeah, depending on on how effective you are at that, it trickles down to the team's level of excitement um, over all aspects of the project. So yep. if you have someone who's no. really excited about what they what they're pitching and, and has a lot of faith in, in what they're doing i think that's that's a super boon to any team um just to, to see like oh this person in charge thinks it's this great and can express that you know um this this uh this excitedly and this you know, they have this level of enthusiasm then you can't help but get swept up in it especially in a team setting yeah it's really interesting i mean i don't think a lot of people or if you ask a lot of gamers like what would it take to develop a game well like the idea of salesmanship for a creative lead it's like well that doesn't compute but it totally makes sense it makes sense how somebody like peter molyneux can rally a team again and again it's like yeah he's a compelling salesman it turns yeah. out yeah you have a you have a unique vision for stuff and you can sell it well then yeah um that's i think that that separates a good team lead from from somebody who's just like well here's bullet points on a list of features we have to have and right. we're not going to explain or 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 justify any of the creative decisions we make you know just put them in and do it um yeah it's also yeah it's also giving people that level of agency that they can say oh i i defined this portion of the game like this was my baby and i i brought it from you know nothing into the shipped game like giving people that sense of of yeah i contributed to this in a meaningful way and and people recognize that yeah that helps out a lot too yeah for sure 
Do you think Halo 4, uh, and yeah, feel free to call us a leading question, uh, was the most stressful project you worked on through your career? There were times where it was. Um, yeah, there, there are different levels of stress. Like there's there's production stress, like this, like the the you know the the pipelines and the workflows are bad. There's there's the stress of oh, will it ever live up to you know myself as a huge Halo fan? I was like, oh, is, can it live up to this legacy? In terms of that, like in terms of the expectations I put on my I uh, that I put on myself. Um, to just just oh, don't screw it up don't screw it up <laughs> like there was that stress yeah um so that that was ever present there, in, in terms of like overall level of stress i think there have been like like worse places i've been but but no that um halo 4 like the 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 team i was on was was super strong like like we all enjoyed working together like we tr- we just knew we were making the best thing that we could given the circumstances um so that helped alleviate that a little bit, but it's just, yeah, that con- even even today, I will look at forum threads online about, oh, Halo Four campaign was it was it actually good? <laughs> like, I hope so. <laughs> um, <laughs> do, um, do you think it was? I think it was. It was. Um, let me word this very carefully. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, in terms of what we were capable of, I I think it was a, it was very good. Like we we wanted to get bread and butter halo and and we wanted to to not really rock the boat a crazy amount but still deliver like that that hey like quality halo experience and i think in terms of the campaign stuff i worked on um that was always in the back of my mind and and i think in a lot of ways yeah we did deliver some some good encounters like when you think of halo you always think of like like you think of it as a series of encounters and like yeah. I think in my head, like, Oh, some encounters I made, I, I am actually still super proud of to this day. Like, um, so, so yeah, I, I in a, in a word, yes, I think it was, I think it was good. Nice. And then what was the end of three, four, three, four, you like, uh, so I was, um, at three, four, three up until I think a year before halo five shipped. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, we, I was in, I was in pre-pro up through actual production for Halo 5. Um, and then, uh, I go back to Bungie. <laughs> um, yeah. You can't it's, escape it's, it. I can't escape the, yeah, pull keeps pulling me in. Cause, um, <laughs> at that point, um, the cross pollination between 343 and Bungie was, was always kind of strong. Yeah. Um, and so I'd hear things about Destiny I'd never know exactly what it was because even when I was at, I was on reach, there was a team working on destiny. Yeah. Even that far back. Well, yeah, um, there was that Easter egg tease. Was it, was it an ODST where they had that? ODST, tease? Yeah. It's so wild. Um, so there was always a dedicated team working on it even back then. And you'd hear whispers about like, Oh, this is what this team's working on. Have you seen X, Y, Z? Um, and, and so then, then they showed it at that E3 was like okay this looks like something that i want to be a part of so so yeah going going over to bungie was was um was in a design capacity that was like it for me at the time it was like well this is this is this is like how can it get better than this um, yeah were you there super exciting. before the launch of the first one then i was there two weeks before the launch of, of the original destiny oh boy yeah <laughs> that is a wild time yeah it was it was Never, never in my career have I had that kind of super, super excited. Like, oh, this is gonna be great! I, I get, I got to play, I got to play the finished version before it came out, and then I was like, this is really cool. Can't wait for people to get their hands on it. And then the reaction was just a complete 180. <laughs> Yeah. It, it, um, oh God. I mean, being on the team, I can't imagine trying to sift through the feedback at the launch of Destiny because it was a weird thing where the press did not get early access. Like nobody was telling anybody the quality of this thing. It's just like, bam, here's Destiny. And everyone was just trying to wrap their minds around what did they build here? And the people that yeah. loved it really loved it and there was gold in there, but then there was a lot of things just yeah. like this mission design what is happening here i'm pressing so many yeah. buttons what the hell <laughs> I'm, I'm opening so many doors with yeah. my friend peter dinklage um <laughs> so yeah getting getting there during that time was it was kind of um uh, interesting to see the internal reaction to that was not doom and gloom like oh this sucks we all you know we're all super sad it was okay what do we need to do immediately to turn this around um, yeah, 
So that was super exciting to like to ride that wave because it's easy to get pulled down into despair <laughs> over stuff like the Destiny One launch, but um, just just the the reaction to it um, is something I don't think I'll see again in my career. Just a whole team rallying behind, like, okay, here's what works, here's what doesn't. Let's you know, let's start shoving it full of good stuff. I mean, that is like um, that is ground zero for just like that turning point in the industry because you're arriving on that team after everybody's been through hell, gutting this thing, trying to rework Destiny into something shippable, and you're arriving right when they're at the finish line, but then the finish line just brrr, extends right when it launches. Like, that's such a bizarre perspective just to see this entire team not exactly relieved to finish it because really the race is just starting. Yeah, because typically I'd, I'd been in the industry long enough to get into the rhythm of, okay, you start production ship and it's right. done and you take, everyone goes on vacation and it's fine. And then the birth of the live service game is, oh no, it's always, there is only game. <laughs> There's only, there is only, you know, roadmap. Um, so yeah, it was an interesting transitional period to see like the, the, the death of the traditional dev cycle in a way. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I visiting Bungie uh, maybe three times uh, with Game Informer. Um, it, it, I, I was constantly amazed just how committed that team was to trying to make something great, trying to listen to fan feedback. That community was so strong and so vocal. Um, it always was just a, every other time anybody else in the industry was trying to make a living game. I, I just felt horrified for them. Cause it's like, man, I've seen Bungie just get raked through the coals, just our glimpses of visiting the studio and just knowing like how brutally difficult that is. And yeah. then, you know, just to, you know, so, uh, Bioware, like with Anthem, going on that cover story trip, they're like, we're going to we're gonna make one of these living service games, these live service games. It's like, oh my God, you guys, <laughs> this is going to yeah. be so much more brutal than you could ever imagine. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, even even now, like, I think Destiny has found a good a good rhythm. It's found a good, yeah. you know, um, it's, it's in a really good place right now. Um, but I just remember going to a meeting, um, for Taken King, which that was my first big project was, was, um, awesome. Starting on Taken King. And they're like, okay, you have, you have ideas. Let's get them in there. <laughs> let's get whatever, anything you want to do. Let's, let's turn the ship around. Cause uh, yeah, Taken King was, was the point where the, yeah, there was a, a uh, kind of line in the sand it's like we're absolutely going to turn this around we have the team to do it we we've had you know this experience with what works and what doesn't in destiny and so sitting in there with with uh uh the other um public space lead and then i think it was luke smith and it was just like we want to make this hive ship i think the 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 direction was inscrutable loot filled fortress and so my my job on on taking king was you know take get get in the hive ship Fill it with cool secret stuff, um, and just if you can think of the wildest idea you can, just put it in there, and we'll see what sticks. And yeah, that was absolutely the funnest job I've ever had. Just because of the kind of chaos of it, of just the creativity of it. Yeah, the creativity, the freedom. Because I, I was I was not incredibly senior at that time, um, but I was given the 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 leeway to just be like if you have a good idea at least get it in the game and we'll we'll play test it together um obviously we need a quick turn on it because yeah um because of the 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 importance of the project but it was just like hey i made an ambient world event where you have to crouch next to a stinky worm to get <laughs> to get a stink on you and then jump across some platforms and open a, a chest that only opens when you're stinky. And they're like, good, awesome, ship it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a lot full of, of wacky stuff we were able to just slip in under the radar. So, yeah, it was, it was super fun. And then just seeing where, where the game went from there was was really, like, that was a ride, too. Um, yeah. We've, yeah. Uh, we've heard horror stories about the, the tech of uh, yeah. Destiny, especially early on. Where the, was the tool, were the tools pretty pretty rough back then? pretty slow i think yeah the, the there are some there are some horror stories about iteration time in destiny one but to give all credit to where it's due for that that tools and engineering team they they got it to a place where it was just night and day um which is why i think you see that destiny has a cadence now that oh you know, it's it's feasible to make these releases and and have them consistently come out and and no one's really worried about anymore, that anymore which is yeah like all credit to to those tools teams because it was at a point where if you're in i think 
these stories have come up before, but if you're in the editor making a slight change to something, it has to rebuild for hours and hours and hours. So if you're like, oh, if you're working on an enemy encounter and you want to iterate quickly, it's not really that possible or feasible under under that system. But yeah, they, they have got it to a really good place now. And I'm, nice. yeah, I'm super proud of that team. At least they had an undo. I mean, that's a, yeah, at that's least, a big step up. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> uh, that is. So I, I'm just curious about like what it was like to be within Bungie in this incredibly, incredibly pivotal time for the overall game industry. I mean, they were really the first, well, I guess, you know, MMOs before then, all that stuff. But it seems like a new yeah, yeah. era of trying to just make this a living game. Um, did it feel like you were just being punched by the internet every single day for the amount of feedback you were receiving? Was it four years of everybody running around with different degrees of their hair on fire? Or like, what does it feel like from your ground floor perspective? Seeing feedback, um, especially for the stuff that I made, I wouldn't get a lot of feedback that directly related to my job because I, I... My, my primary job was the world design of the public spaces in the games. So as, uh, as long as no one had super strong feedback about, oh, this enemy is placed in a weird space in the open world, like I didn't really see a lot of it. Right. Um, what we did get the impression of was people just content, people are hungry for content. Yeah. However, you can you can get that content in um, and 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 get it in to, to places where players can easily access it and they, they want their rituals and they want their, um, you know, they want the game to feel less, less dead and empty. So that was, that was to me an opportunity to just kind of explore what we could do in, in this open world to, to give players that feeling of like, number one, there's lots of stuff to do. Number two, it's fun to discover this stuff and it's fun to like play with my friends and share this information as to how this, this stuff got unlocked. And then, um, and then just yeah, just watch players uncover the secrets that I thought it would take them six months on Earth in like five minutes. Yeah, um, but you can't focus too much on the negative feedback. Like that'll that'll kill you. Like yeah. the feedback we were getting. Like I think another thing Bungie is exceptionally good at is is kind of collating that feedback, um, prioritizing it into like what's what's going to be the the best thing for the player. Like what's the best player facing things we can do. And um, yeah, well again so much respect for that team and, and how they're able to take just the, f the phenomenal amount of differing opinions. Cause there's no one way to play that game, right. but everyone thinks that their way is the best. Um, so so wh yeah. what is the, the biggest lesson you think you learned from that era of Bungie? Um, don't be afraid to try new stuff. I think get weird. Um, yeah, we, we got pretty weird with it. Um, and it's also a credit to that team that they were open to it. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, we experimented with some stuff, not all of it worked. Um, but I think the stuff that we ended up shipping, um, on, on I won't speak to, to other teams, but the stuff that, that our world teams shipped was, was really, really cool. And at, at the time, not a lot of people were, were doing it. Like we had systems set up in that hive dreadnought. I don't know how much you, you played. It's been a while, but yeah, space. taken King was really like my, my peak playtime for Destiny. Yeah. yeah. But it was things like, Oh, if you go into this space on a certain day, because we had the, we had the luxury of oh, there's there's a in-game world clock that's always running that no one was really using, so I was like, okay, oh, we if we expose that to world design, we can have different encounters that happen on different days. We can have um, if you go here at this certain time, this thing spawns that you can only see at this time, um, which I think we've also learned isn't always super great to kind of in terms of like getting new players in, but if you yeah, it, it was a lot of uh, interesting experimentation, a lot of like taking things we had access to and exposing it, and and um, yeah, hopefully it it put the game in a good direction. Like yeah. that's all you can hope for. What um, did you learn um, anything about um, Jason Jones? Did you get uh, some good insight on game development from him, or was it just uh, was he off in another room just thinking really hard about stuff? Didn't have a lot of opportunities to interact with Jason. Um, but he he is a very busy individual, I yeah. would say. Like, yeah, um, yeah. But I had when I when you go through the interview loop over there, at least when I did, um, the last interview they set you up with is is Jason. And he's just like, oh. yeah, just ask me anything about development, anything about the company, anything that's on your mind. And so I just ended up spending like an hour and a half just being like uh, fanboying out in weird ways. <laughs> and you had worked uh, there multiple times before, and still you get yeah, the fanboy yeah, yeah. out. Mm -hmm. Do you remember anything specific yeah. and any any good exchanges there? Oh, just about what he imagined the future of of games as a as a medium were. Just getting that kind of insight. Um, 
and it's wild to see like his his insight coming <laughs> like slowly 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 over the years we're like oh so what jason said what happened this <laughs> um but but yeah like like that's probably one of the one of the most in-depth like design conversations i've ever had condensed into like an hour or so that's wild. But, yeah he's, he's one of those people that when you talk to him you're like yeah he absolutely gets it like um, you 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 make a make it a point in your mind to like yeah if you sort when you're sorting into like bs artists and people who know what they're talking about yeah jason is definitely one of those guys who knows what he's doing yeah oh, that's awesome uh that must be the most valuable thing on your resume at this point like to be in the trenches at bungie for that period of time i feel like everyone's like oh my god come on board and share some lessons please um yeah i i i, I can't say that yeah there, there have been a lot of open world studios uh, that that experience is super valuable a lot of like games as a service studios that experiences are super valuable like um yeah it, it's definitely the the thing that people see on the resume and, and are the most interested in talking about like because destiny is just such an interesting game it's such an interesting interesting intellectual property like yeah. everything around it is is just yeah so compelling at least to me i don't know about everybody else <laughs> no um, i think so <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's 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 one of those things that stands out, and, and I'll always be in, immensely proud uh, that I was able to be on that team with with just some of the smartest friggin' people. Like just getting things to mechanically work in that game is such an ordeal when you when you know how it works. And that's one of those coming back to that discussion about like a company is saying, oh, we're gonna start our service game. Yeah, it's just oh, you don't know, yeah. <laughs> you don't know all these pieces that we had to figure out and, and put together um yeah <laughs> so how did the transition happen to the next place then um so i was at e3 uh 2018 um and i saw an announcement from square enix that they were opening a new studio uh in tokyo um and they were making a push for international talent so the, the the draw to them was, hey, we want to recruit people from all over the world. So your your language skills, even though I, I speak a little bit of Japanese, I spoke a little bit of Japanese before that, like language skills, we have on-site translators and interpreters. We just want the knowledge, like we want the, the skills that you have. Yeah. So on, just on a whim, I, I sent an email asking for more info because it, it had been a dream of mine to, to work and, and live in Japan, you know, since you see, you see I saw that Nintendo sign. Of course, yeah. It's like, yeah. Um, but but getting to to live and work in Japan at a company like Square was that was that was another one of those things. I was like, oh, I'll never do that. There's no chance. But um, but yeah, lo and behold, they sent me like the next day. They were like, oh yeah, we want to talk to you. We really want to talk to you. <laughs> um, so it was yeah, a series of of uh, video interviews over a couple of days, and they're like, yeah, we we want to bring you on board. That's awesome. Were you talking to Tabata at a certain point? Then was he still director at that point? So in between my first interview and accepting the offer, I got a a, a very urgently worded email. It's like, oh, please, gotta, we want to get on a call with you as soon as possible. And they delivered the news like, oh, Tabata's not no longer attached to the project. Um, if that impacts your decision in any way, and I was like, oh no, not really. <laughs> um, because the, yeah, what I wanted to do was you know learn about Japanese development, work on a new IP from the ground up. That was another super compelling thing to me. Yeah. Um, and just being over in, in Japan and living that you know Japanese game dev life was was something I was I was super excited about. So one one person wouldn't really you know cause that to fall apart, but yeah. But you got the was, impression that like there was a, a bit pretty big upheaval in development at that period as well, right? I got that impression. Yeah. Um, but. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that that kind of um, evened out a little shortly after I got there. There was some, yeah, you know, there, there, there was some turmoil for a bit. But yeah, the team over there, again, like it's a it's a great team. Like they yeah. they're so um, like the, the one of the reasons I wanted to go over there as well was like looking at the open world of Final Fantasy XV, which was this team's previous project. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, there's, it's such a cool world that they built. At least to me, it was, it was a very, like, it was very different from the traditional open worlds you saw in games, and, and the potential that was there was was super intriguing to me. So, yeah, so that's what brought me over there was was their technical proficiency, like like new IP with this engine and this this kind of world building talent was, yeah, that was something I was motivated to to get in and take a look at yeah and even by the end of your time there does it still feel like the core of that team is the 15 team 
Hard to say. Um, there are definitely some people there who who were kind of fundamental in, in the development of 15. But as as, as with, with with all game projects, like even even Bungie, you go back and, and see over the, the years how those teams shift and change. Yeah. Um, it, it's pretty typical over the lifespan of any game, any studio that that those those core members will fluctuate and people will go their just their separate ways. So yeah. Um, but I, I do think a lot of the original vision um, that the team had is 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 in that core product. So nice. Yeah. So what was uh, your experience then? Like, it's your dream to go over there. I assume you're just a fan of Final Fantasy games, old Square games, that whole. That yeah, whole yeah, yeah, totally. Okay. Um, so. <laughs> It's just the it's it's the weird little things um, that and how Japanese development compares to Western development. The the biggest thing that would always, would always get me when talking to people outside the company was in America a designer is hey they design gameplay systems they design levels they you know they're they're um, they're the ones like crafting the fun of the game in Japan a designer is just a blanket term for an artist. So, so if I say, oh, I'm a, I'm a designer at Square Enix, they're like, oh, what pretty pretty pictures do you draw? <laughs> um, Interesting. So yeah, the, the people who are who are doing Western, like what Western studios would call design, are called planners. Right. So I was I was a planner. I was a world planner. Um, so just the the vocabulary is different. Um, just just game, both playing and developing terminology, you have to learn a whole, a whole separate vocabulary on top of on top of Japanese that you're studying. <laughs> outside of work yeah um yeah like the japanese term for grinding like what is that it's like literally translated as oh you're digging a hole <laughs> <laughs> so when i was like trying to convey to people like oh is there any grinding you're doing in the game like what grinding what is that and you have to like literally look up the term oh yeah uh, is there any hole digging in this game <laughs> <laughs> oh hole um, digging yes 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 yeah we get it yeah digging a hole um so yeah things like that were, were, were different um the way teams are structured i, I don't want to sp- like i'll, I'll pre preface all this by saying like i don't want to come off as somebody who has an in-depth knowledge of japanese development like of course, i worked yeah, at one yeah, company yeah. yeah but i'll just you know what struck me is as different um but yeah the team team structures are different um just like the, the way, uh like the overall structure of square with like the bd1 bd2 and all that stuff or like even within that yeah you know, within the teams like like the way um work is kind of partitioned and and, and distributed was different um yeah different uh, roles had different responsibilities. So, typically, like some sometimes in the West, um, you'd have designers who, like, le- for example, level design in the West is not really a job in Japan until like pretty recently. The level design as we describe it. So, oh. a traditional Western level designer, they'll plan out the space. They'll kind of describe like, okay, this is what happens at this point. They make the enemy encounters and they define all that information. Um, here. It's more. It's uh, I'm not here, but in in Japan, it's much more of a top-down structure where things are kind of plotted, plotted and planned out. Like the planner will say, "Okay, this is what I want to happen at these places," and then another person will implement it. Or that's just an example. But like, there's there's a lot of um, roles where the the separation of of what I thought I was going to do would be uh, on somebody else, and what somebody else was doing was on me. So it's it's just it's not. Uh, uh, better or worse, it's just a different way of, of thinking about so that kind of thing. How would you summarize the distinction? It's just more director driven. Is that is that the easy? I'd say that's that's one of my biggest takeaways. Was yeah, things were defined in in very specific terms from a, a higher level, and the amount of leeway you get is a lot lower in in my experience. Yeah, you're, you're, um, not, you're not putting stink bugs into this world. <laughs> yeah um so yeah it's it's uh it's it's much much clearer direction which is why i think you have such iconic japanese you know directors who kind of still are are notable in the public eye like you have yeah. people like miyamoto and kojima like they have these visions that are very to the letter like planned out and and you're executing on that vision um but uh yeah i think that's the biggest difference i was able to see did you have very, um do you have suggestions um, when you are working back in Western game development now of like, oh, you know, Japanese game development is structured this way. We should actually take that idea. Like you're the, you have the best perspective on this, being able to mix and match the best yeah. ideas and philosophies. But is there anything you would take from the Japanese world that you think works really well? 
Um, just to reiterate what I said earlier, which was strong creative leadership is is a vision the and selling a vision. Okay. Um, yep. And and as much as you can define early on, because another thing that that it was that struck me as different between the two sides was Western documentation on well, as a game is being developed, not the greatest. Like any game I've worked on in the West, you want to look up the the most recent information on like, oh, what's this level look like now? What's this enemy look like now? Someone wrote a one page document five years ago and it's immediately out of date. Um, Japanese development, they were methodical about documentation like if this enemy spawn point moves <laughs> like we're updating our internal documentation um so that kind of discipline um i think would be super valuable and I, I know like like in the west development all, always kind of devolves into like a cacophony of <laughs> like everything's on fire all the time and um but it, yeah valuing good documentation um early in the project and maintaining it is something that I think has a tangible effect. Yeah. Were there plenty of situations though, where once you got working on this thing, you were just pulling your hair out about like, why, why are things structured this way with the team? It's clearly better if we do it this way. What's wrong with everybody? Um, no, there, there were those times early on where, um, I would suggest, you know, ways to, to improve workflows and stuff. And, and honestly, like they were super receptive to it oh, that's uh, awesome. to their credit. Um, in terms of, of, um, things like workflow when it comes to plotting out, you know, level structures and things like super in the weeds, like nerdy stuff. But but it was it was surprising the amount of of um, of openness they they showed to to these different methods. Because I mean, honestly, like why would you go through the trouble of hiring someone from you know right. thousands of miles away if you didn't want to hear their insight and stuff? So they they were they were super receptive to those kind of things. Yeah, and imagine a situation where every time you say, well, working on Destiny, and everyone would be like, all right, Dan, I, you have the floor. We can't argue no, with this. No. Luckily, no one in Japan knows what Destiny is. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> no, no, there, there's, a, there's a dedicated fan base in Japan for Destiny. It's not as big as it is in the West, but but in terms of, of like using it as a touchstone for development work, not a lot of people... We're, we're hip to, to destiny stuff. So interesting. It was, it was kind of fun kind of describing like, like the many layers of destiny design to people. There were, there was, there were a couple people. I had my cave figurine up on my desk. And so that was like a, a beacon to the, the destiny fans we had in the studio who would approach me. So that was always a welcome site when I'd mention it and they'd be like, Oh, I know what that is. I love it. It's cool. Um, <laughs> That's but awesome. 90%, 99% of the time people were like, what is destiny? I have no idea. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Why should we care? Yeah. So what, uh, what are you most proud of on that project that you worked on? Ooh, I will say, um, in terms of individual contribution to a game, in terms of from from start from, from from the very beginning, it's the most actual like content I've ever produced for a game. Oh, like interesting. Yeah, in terms of like like square footage of actual level design work I've done, um, I think the the majority of it is in Forspoken now. So just getting getting to be a part of the process from the beginning, getting to work with people that I respect immensely um there was a member of my team like i the first meeting i had i walk into the into the meeting room and and one of my coworkers was like yes yeah, see that guy there he designed the materia system for final fantasy 7 i'm like are up. you kidding me shut up did you <laughs> talk to him? did you talk to him yeah, yeah he was on my team i had regular interactions with him um but uh things like like you'd get those those random meetings with people even even outside of work like i'd be one of the weirdest coincidences of my life was I was sitting at the regular bar I'd go to every Friday in my neighborhood and the bartender talks to the guy next to me and it's like oh this this guy is in game development too you guys should talk and see you know what what you have in common and the guy next to me was a systems designer on Valkyrie profile oh my <laughs> like, god that's are you awesome kidding me? <laughs> and they're always just these unassuming like salary man type people you know no egos they're like yeah I just worked on that for a couple of years and I worked on this you know, UFO catcher game and that UFO everyone, catcher. Everyone, yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone just kind of, you know, does the work and, and goes home and keeps a good, healthy balance between the two. But yeah, it was, it was super crazy. Like I, I, I there was also another time where I'm, I'm meeting with a coworker and he brought a bunch of his friends from Capcom over to go out drinking with us. And I strike up a conversation with the guy next to me and I'm like, Oh, what'd you do at Capcom? He's like, Oh, I'm the level designer for the resident evil mansion. Oh, <laughs> like, what? 
It's like, oh, okay, okay. I, I made a fun shooty game that you've never heard of. <laughs> like, oh, I'm going to go sit in the corner now. Um, yeah, th- that was a huge, like, dream come true, just being in the industry like that. Yeah. Uh, so what did you learn, being a big fan of Square and, and their past work and then being embedded in one of the development studios? What's, what's the takeaway? Do you have a new perspective on those games you love from back in the day? Just, it's the same lesson you learn anywhere you go, which is, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's yeah. game, making video games is hard. No matter where you are in the world, no matter the reputations of the people you're working with, like, at the end of the day, you, you got to ship it. And, yeah, that's, that's – um, and, and it was also a, a lot of lessons about being a, really, a more effective communicator. Like when you have an email that you're writing that you know is going to be translated and it has to, it has to be as right, succinct as right. possible to get the point across, you, you don't want any wiggle room in what you're describing. So it's always good to be a good, succinct communicator in games in general. But over there, I think I leveled up my, my documentation and email writing skills to be like, okay, now you have to understand this. Otherwise, I have to write a whole new email and yeah, a yeah, whole lot of that. Yeah, but, yeah. So, so your job itself, you... you we're very hands-on for this game and designing the world, designing encounters. Is it kind of that same philosophy of I'm going to drop two ghosts over here and a warthog over here, except now you're just in the open world of I'm going to drop some freaky looking unicorn over here. And it's, it's a question of, of scale. Um, it's like, how long should it take to go from point A to point B? Like, like it's, it's, dividing the world into manageable chunks for both workflow purposes and for the purposes of like, I'm a player in this game. I need to know where I'm going, what's important. Right, right. Um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of content partitioning. So it's like, okay, how much content do we have here? Where do we distribute it? What kind of content goes where? Like in a big open world game like that, yeah, you, you need those, those kind of things made and, and kind of distributed evenly among the world. Like you got to have stuff to do, you got to, and, and it's got to be easy to get to, and, and it's got to be memorable. And so I was balancing all that on a big region of the world was, yeah, it was my responsibility for a while. I know you haven't played Elden Ring yet, but I'm going to be so fascinated when you eventually do. I God, mean, I, want, oh. I, mean I, yeah. I, I assume you like Breath of the Wild. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. It's, yeah. Um, Breath of the Wild, um, just a transformative game. God, this is okay. Like, you, you, this is you are the person that we want to talk to, Dan, because <laughs> you are working on a new IP that's an open world game after the success of Breath of the Wild. Is it tough not to constantly reference that? Do you get to walk in and go up to a whiteboard and just write Breath of the Wild style world? Let's go. Yeah, it, and, and it was also a thing after the original Dark Souls came out. Like, yeah, you have design meetings where. Oh, we can't talk about Dark Souls. Nobody talk about Dark Souls. We've heard enough about Dark Souls. <laughs> um, but it's it's hard to to you want to you want it to be its own thing. The thing you're working on, you want it to have its own identity. So right, those those, those conversations are useful when it comes to things like oh, the, I want this feeling in the world. I want you know I want this feeling of discovery. I want this feeling of I want I want to evoke these emotions. But it it's kind of for me it stops when you're like we need to imp- we need to wholesale take this system and try to shoehorn it into the game right like that's right. the challenge you have to you have to evoke those feelings without you know going to in, in a way that your game is good at expressing them is yeah don't you have moments though of just saying can we just make this fully open can we make this game to the point that you can go anywhere out of the gate and just how do you, how do you encourage that level of exploration and immersion in an open world Versus yeah. let's just guide players from point A to point B. Yeah, it's always a trade-off um, because when you're trying to make a more story-driven game, like you have to have those beats that you hit. You have to have those gating points that say, okay, we're delivering this piece of the narrative here, which explains the context of this next thing over here. Right. Um, so it's, there's, there's that part of it, and then there's also the technical aspect of it, which is... Like if it's if, okay, if it's this open, then it's got to look this much worse. You know, like you have to make those compromises right. um, where you can. So, so, um, and it's also about hmm, what's what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not stepping on anyone's toes, like like in terms of oh, design has to has to have what they want. So we're going to impose this this you know mandate on on art or effects or or any other team. It's um, it's knowing where you know your your level of influence kind of tops out and like i was saying before about japanese structures 
Right. Yeah, you have to do a good job of convincing the director, like, okay, this is the best course of action. Um, so when you are working on a project and one of the first bullet points is we want to tell a compelling story, then it's like, okay, that's limiting how we can structure this open world and we have to live with it. Yeah, I would say, well, yeah, it's it's this thing has to happen in this sequence before we introduce this thing. And yeah, yeah that makes it a little tougher. Um, Breath of the Wild had the, had the benefit of saying, oh yeah, it's a more freeform experience. You can take it on in any order you want. Um, but I, I hear a criticism of that game is like, yeah, the narrative wasn't as strong as I would have liked it. I would have, yeah, but. Well, you know. look, it's like, is it suffering for it? No. I mean, it's the same <laughs> thing with Elden Ring. You look at the level of yeah. enthusiasm for these games and it's like, I'd hate to tell the game industry how about we take storytelling down a notch, but at times I want to tell the game industry to take storytelling just down a notch or just be a little more subtle with it, yeah, right? I totally, I totally get it. Yeah. Um, but then you have people like when Destiny launched, oh, all your lore is in little cards. Right. <laughs> you go to a right, website and right. look at. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely a, a balancing act there. Um, and and I think something the holy grail, yeah, right now is is Breath of the Wild. Um, and ju I'm just always thinking of ways to how, what's the next step? Like what's, what's the next, because we have a reactive world with breath of the wild. We have these incredible systems. Yeah. What's yeah. What's next after that? That's, that's you, the question. You should play Elden Ring. Uh, I can't, I can't. <laughs> my computer's in a shipping container. I, uh, from you'll, Tokyo. You'll get to it eventually. won't be here till July. <laughs> oh, that's torture. Um, <sighs> hey, you're working on a new game, man. You got to get research and the best out there, but anyway, absolutely. So do you feel like you managed to inject a little breath of the wild magic in for spoken? Are there, are there parts that you look back on that you managed to build? And so. say, okay. I think there's something that I, I, I built in there. That's reminiscent of some of that magic. Yeah. I think what people are going to notice first and foremost and this is something you see in the in the in the trailer, so yeah. I'm not spoiling anything. But the mobility systems are great. Like, it's crazy. Yeah, the, we we called it magic parkour, and just the traversal feels unlike anything else out there. I think the freedom of of movement you have to to climb and swing and and do those kind of cool Breath of the Wild exploratory things. I think it's 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 there. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to go into too much detail. I don't know what I can I can't say, but sure, sure. Um, but yeah, I think that's. That's something we we really succeeded with those the the sense of of how do you manage this scale as just you know, a human running around and how do we solve those problems um, and how do we make it fun to traverse this world and explore the way you want to explore um, yeah super looking forward to seeing people get their hands on it yeah uh, hats off to that effects team I don't know. Oh my gosh! What is right? happening? Can you explain how that's possible? <laughs> I'm not that technically inclined, but yeah, there's even even at the the stage where where you see something that and you're like typically seeing placeholder assets for stuff, but just the first passes of all those things when I first saw them, it's like, oh, this this is a good FX team. Like they they they're making it work. Um, I mean, that yeah, has to be one of the the early core pillars. Is like what we wanted. Traversal, magic parkour, and then <laughs> bonkers effects. Go. I, Open world go. Yeah. I, the, the, I think another pillar was yeah, it's gotta look it's gotta look really nice. And I think they're they're doing a good job of of making that magic feel just the imp the impacts you get from it and the 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 effect it has on the world and I, okay I don't want to <laughs> feel like sure. I'm, I'm just slowly dripping into danger zone but I I, I just want to make sure I praise this team because. Um, yeah, they are doing some really, really cool work. And I, yeah, I can't wait to see the finished product. Yeah, yeah. Do you, uh, do you feel like there's misconceptions about the game out there that drive you nuts that you see people uh, beating the drum on? It's every, every game has those. Yeah. <laughs> like every single, every single thing you work on, like, yeah. And you can't, you can't correct anything about it because number one, and NDAs are horrible. <laughs> like, overall, always hanging over your head waiting to, yeah. But, um, but it, you can't correct every misconception you see there's, there's no that that way lies madness right so right yeah it, but, um, you must have been an interesting spot being an english speaker on the team and it seems like they partnered with several rounds of western writers like gary witta and amy hennig and stuff like that did you feel like you were able to add a lot to the team just with a perspective on like oh okay we're focusing on an english script first here honestly my my work was pretty divorced from the storytelling side of things like gotcha. I, I was i was open open world and and you know that kind of thing um but uh yeah i honestly didn't, didn't not a lot of insight into that that process sure but sure. um 
Yeah. yeah. How are you feeling about Forspoken in general? I'm I'm really looking forward to like I said <laughs> like I want to see I want to see well first I want a PS5 before it comes out so I can actually play it. Smart. Um, but I'm I'm really looking forward to to actually getting my hands on it and seeing what that team has done in the in, even in this the span of time that I've been gone seeing that latest trailer is just like okay yeah it's it's it's, it's looking good so yeah I'm I'm looking forward to it. Nice. Uh, so why leave Square? Did you feel like, well, I got the dream experience I was always hoping for and time to do something new? Honestly, um, if you would have asked me a year ago what it would have taken to get me to, to leave, I'd be like, there's not a, there's, you know, there's not a lot. <laughs> like, I loved living in Japan. I loved you know, working, that, that, getting that work experience and seeing that other side of, of things. But sometimes you get an opportunity um, that's just like one of those once-in-a-lifetime things that, that you have to, you know, you have to just toss everything to the side for it. Okay, I'm going for that. Um, so I want to say November, December, uh, I start getting calls from an old coworker of mine. Um, his name is Ray Almaden. He was, uh, but previous to this, he was a co-design director on Horizon Forbidden West. Um, uh, and before that, he worked at Naughty Dog, did um, Uncharted 4, did some work on, on uh, that that and the the Lost Legacy. Um, so he worked on those those titles, and he was the he was my lead at three four three. He was one of the guys who decided to bring me onto the the design team. So he had been working on getting his own studio up and running for for a good a good while, a few years, and he finally had um, he finally had a partner that was going to help seed the company. So he's like, yeah, we need we need people. We're we're looking to form this this team of of people to make you know our collective dream game. Like we always talk about, like, oh, what if you know we could do this and this and this. Um, and so he he came to me with this pitch. He came to me with with the concept and the vision he had for the studio. I was like, I'm I'm all in. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta pack up my life and get out of Tokyo. But it, it was it was a super hard decision. But but in hindsight, just seeing, I've only I've only really been at the studio. Or in an employment capacity for a couple of weeks, but sure. I'm so well, so excited. We're is it the independence? Is it the specific hook of the game? Is it the lore of the world? The role you have? What is it? It's all of those things, honestly. Like being being at the level where first and foremost to me, being at the level where the buck stops with you. <laughs> there were literally when I when I signed on six other employees, so looking at that structure and being like, okay, this is if, you know, we succeed or fail based on our decisions and not something a director says, move this rock three meters to the left. Um, no, it's, it's, it's the independence of, of saying, yeah, we, we're, we're making our own decisions. We're forging our own trail. The game concept is, is great. We have a narrative that is, is unique in the space. Um, the team is, super talented we have people from uh people from gorilla obviously um people from naughty dog a couple couple naughty dogs um some some blizzard folks um we just got a, a sucker punch guy today <laughs> um but, uh, and and it's a combination of people that i've worked with before as well so getting that team chemistry uh, from day one and knowing you know, these are guys I worked with in the trenches, and we all know what what we think works and what doesn't. Um, so we're getting, we're ready to roll day zero. Just yeah. Like I, I made my first in person visit to the studio last week, and just getting into you know a cubicle with these guys that I've worked with like over almost a decade ago, and just feeling like oh, it's it's just all that space in between is kind of compressed, and we're just starting off from the next day when we were all together. Um, that's I think super valuable. That's awesome. Yeah, and a bunch of funding came through from Smilegate, who had a lot of success with Crossfade and or sorry, Crossfire and Lost Ark. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that has to feel incredible. Just like okay, just this yeah. level of independence. Make your dream game. This is your shot. Don't blow it. Uh, absolutely. Just uh, getting to meet some of the Smilegate folks as well in person, and them kind of expressing, you know, hey, we you know we trust you guys. We think you got it. Go. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Let it, you know, keep us keep us posted. But we we trust you. Um, that's that's cool to see. Um, oh, the name of the studio is Postcard Game Studio, by the way. So oh, I thought that we was are, a we're, we're hiring. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, any any yeah, key are. roles uh, you want to blast out there? Um, just just uh, at the website on the website is it's postcardgamestudio.com. 
Uh, so check out the career page there. But there's a variety of, of roles that we're actively looking to fill. So awesome. if you see anything there that catches your eye, and, drop uh, us a line. Do you got a rough timeline for when we're going to get a look at uh, what this world's all about? Don't want to say too soon. Uh, all right. <laughs> but, okay. uh, but yeah, I, I'll let you know. Oh, okay. Uh, but there's yeah. er, early days, fair to say. Very, very early stages. Okay. We, we, have a, we have a very, very tight design that we, I think one of the strengths of the studio is, hey, we knew what we wanted to make day one. And now we're going to hit the ground running and, and really go full steam ahead. Not a lot of room, not a lot of wiggle room for, for change. But um, but yeah, that's that's another thing that compelled me to, to join these group of guys because um, just having such a concrete vision Coming, going back. Oh, we're hearkening back to the, the, the sales conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. We we have a very good pitch man at the at the head of the studio. So, <laughs> um, seeing seeing the vision that that uh, he has combined with like with our with our enthusiasm for the world we want to make and, and the narrative that we're we're building and the the world and the characters is it's very very exciting. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Well, congratulations. A hell of a journey so Thank far, you. man. Yeah, twenty twenty years this year jesus okay let's see well i mean best of luck with postcard hope it lasts forever but you know if you do transition to go somewhere else i mean you, you gotta go to valve rockstar i mean what, what what's, what's, what's left? left yeah what's left I for know. you to conquer my god honestly i i after after i was i was in the halls of bungie i was like this is it there's there's nowhere <laughs> there's nowhere else to go like this has been the goal from day one but then you know as as life goes on you're, you're presented with opportunities and it's it's all been in the service of, of just learning as much as i can and, and working with people i admire and, and who i trust um to get the job done so yeah maybe, hey, maybe if something comes along in the future <laughs> but for now for now in the in the three weeks i've been i've been working on this <laughs> game let's hope that doesn't change awesome well hey dan thanks for uh talking about your entire career man appreciate it Absolutely. I appreciate you taking the time, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird to see it in this, just lay it out all in, in an hour and a half and, and just go through the, the whole, the whole shebang, but it's insightful. Yeah. Cool. Appreciate yeah. it. And thank you so much for watching or listening to this interview. If you enjoyed it, you can always subscribe to MinMax's YouTube channel or check out our interview playlist where we have a bunch more interviews, um, that hopefully are interesting as well. Cool. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye. That was a terrible sign off. And I hope the others are interesting as well. I hope this one wasn't terrible. No. But there are better ones. <laughs> Videos like this are possible because MinMax is a completely independent outlet for games supported solely by the community. The only reason we don't have to create condescending clickbait is because folks like you click on the subscribe button or check out the benefits over on patreon.com slash minmax with two ends. We think that we're the most efficient gaming outlet out there. So please take a look at what we've done and imagine what more we can do with your support.